So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining today's um, hybrid online and offline event related to the topic about biomedical innovation and investment in Hong Kong. Uh, for those who are not familiar with myself, I'm Andy Wong. I'm from Invest Hong Kong, Head of Innovation and Technologies. I will be the MC today as well as the tea lady and tea man today as well. So we are pleased to have 120 guests to be here today. Thank you, first of all, for them to spend the time to come over to this event. And we also have around 200 people online um, joining um, this event with the live stream from um, Asia and also Europe and also US time zone. To start with, I would like to thank you for uh, three supporting organizations, including um, Hong Kong uh, Science and Technology Park, Hong Kong API Association Pharmaceutical Industry, and Hong Kong Curing Exchange Limited to be the um, joining to support this event and also be the keynote speaker as well. And also for the Inno Health Center to come up to give us update about the development in the center. I think without further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Stephen Phillips, Director General of Investment Promotion from Invest Hong Kong to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to take my mask off, otherwise I can't see my glasses fog up so much. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It really is a great pleasure to be joining you. And um, may I add my very warm welcome to this event, um, the journey of biotech innovation and investment in Hong Kong. And what an exciting journey it is. Um, as I engage with businesses, partners, governments, all around the world, um, biotech and life sciences is one of the opportunities that I very often talk about. And I highlight it with unbridled enthusiasm because I think the ingredients that we've got in Hong Kong are exceptionally special. And I can tell you, it's a message that is really well received. As the title of today's event implies, we really are on a journey. And that means we've got more potential and more work to do to realize our full potential. Amongst other things, we really need this effective collaboration across the whole of the ecosystem. And that's why it's so great to see so many relevant participants and organizations involved today. And I would like to thank in particular our speakers who will be sharing their up-to-date insights with all of us. As you may know, over the last five years, the Hong Kong SAR government has put in about 150 billion Hong Kong dollars into innovation and technology as an agenda. And it ties into the 14th five-year plan. And you will have noted how important innovation and technology was um, during the visit of President Xi Jinping just a few days ago. And I'm sure that we will all agree that innovation and technology is really where the future of Hong Kong lies, particularly when we look at Hong Kong in the context of the Greater Bay Area. Of course, R&D is a crucial part of innovation and technology and leveraging our world-class universities and the entrepreneurship that Hong Kong is so well known for is really crucial in this regard. Um, I think we're going to be hearing a little bit about the two research clusters that have been set up under the Inno Hong Kong moniker. At the Science Park, one focuses on healthcare technologies and the other on artificial intelligence and robotics. And I think there's lots and lots of scope, as you will know much better than I do, for interaction and collaboration between the two. Drilling into a little bit more detail, the two Inno Hong Kong research clusters comprise 28 research laboratories set up by local universities with foreign partners, whether universities or research institutes, and indeed mainland partners. And among them, of particular relevance to our discussion today, 16 of them are on biomedical or healthcare related technology. Clearly, the research that is taking place 
is really important to the promotion of our development in the healthcare space. And what we're looking at is obviously responding to the needs in society, whether it's the aging society in, in Hong Kong or the contemporary issues we're facing with pandemics, not only COVID, um, but monkeypox as well. The research projects cover a very wide area. I won't go into them. I'm sure we're going to learn more about them later today. So I think as we continue our unrelenting journey ahead, there's even more that we all need to do together. There's some great things on the horizon that will help us to have an even bigger, bolder, and more exciting future commercially. Let me mention just a few of them. The planned Inno Life Healthcare Hub at Lot Ma Chow Loop, Hong Kong, Shenzhen INT Park is one of them on the horizon. The Northern Metropolis as that great project um, is going to provide the land and the space um, for technology driven and biotech companies to grow. The Santin Technopole comprising Hong Kong and Shenzhen INT Park and the areas nearby and that integration, that connectivity with GBA is going to be so very important. So I think there's even more ingredients that are going to refine our recipe for the future. At the outset, I mentioned the sort of depth and breadth of the ecosystem. And I think it's great that HKEX are with us today and Michael's here because one really important ingredient is the need for capital, whether it's debt or equity. And Hong Kong really is first rate there. One of the world's top three international financial centers. And in particular, we have the pre-revenue rules allowing the listing um, of biotechs in Hong Kong. And I can tell you that garners loads of attention from around the world, but I'm sure Michael will go into more depth on that. Last but not least is how Hong Kong for an international or mainland business can really open up opportunities in Hong Kong itself. But the Greater Bay Area gives immediate scale, roughly 10 times the size of Hong Kong in terms of population. But then we've got the rest of the country, and then you've got the proximity to ASEAN, and for some of the companies, even further afield. For instance, at Invest Hong Kong, we just opened an office in Kazakhstan. So we see growing opportunities, including in life sciences and healthcare, um, in Central Asia. So for Invest Hong Kong, it's a top priority. And on that set, maybe I could just say a little bit about Invest Hong Kong for those of you who don't know us. Um, we're a department of the Hong Kong SAR government, and our role is to both attract and retain international and mainland companies to set up and grow here in Hong Kong. Our work is very practical. It's helping companies make things happen. And that's at every step of the way. So we help them during the planning stage. What might Hong Kong mean for them? Then we help them through setup, we help them through launching, networking is part of that. But ultimately, we want investors who invest in Hong Kong to grow. Um, and that is really important for the economy. It's really important for the people of Hong Kong as we create high quality jobs. So if I or the team at Invest Hong Kong can ever help, we're there. If you want a sounding board, um, please feel free to get in touch. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. And again, if I could thank the speakers who will be sharing their insights with us. So please do enjoy the morning. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the uh, opening remark. So I think in the next five minutes, I would like to give a snapshot about Hong Kong biomedical industry. And then at the same time, I would like to introduce a different speaker uh, for today. Um, maybe next slide, please. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think um, for those who may not be familiar with Hong Kong, in particular for the life and health science development in Hong Kong, I would like to take this chance to give an introduction, quick introduction. So um, 
I think um, this is a blank sheet of paper, but I want to fill it up, fill it up right? starting from research to translational research to clinical trial to commercialization. And then along three different layers from the academic research and market, and then to the financial access to market and also government support. So to start with, so um, basic research, we have all those five top universities in Hong Kong, including two medical school and state key lab in Hong Kong. For the translational research, we got science, Hong Kong Science and Technology Park with the Translational Research Institute in which Dr. Grace Lau will be the keynote speaker to talk more about the update about the development of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park and which including the incubation program, venture capital and also other facility available. And then we move on to the Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovation and Technology Park, which uh, Patrick Seal, CEO of the organization, will give us the update about this. And then, of course, we have a help at Inner Hong Kong with a couple of center. The professor will give us the latest development about the, the, the um, current situation about the different centers. In addition to that, Hong Kong also have the Genomes Institute and also uh, other global institute available in Hong Kong. Moving on to the clinical trial, uh, we have um, high quality of clinical data, which four hospitals are credited for the phase one by the NMPA, and also the data is also accredited by the FDA and EMA. And also uh, we have two uh, hospitals which is classified um, for phase one clinical trial. And also we have different CRO available in Hong Kong doing the clinical research in Hong Kong or doing multi-center clinical research as well. And then moving on to the commercialization. We also have hospital authority launching the smart hospital and also the dual track um, uh, healthcare system, which is uh, the most efficient um, um, globally as well. So um, we can see that we are moving from the um, uh, bench to bed side. And also we want to go to the boardroom as well later on. And access to the capital. So we are uh, in Hong Kong, for example, we have a start me up program. So we collaborate with different um, startup and also venture capital and also um, venture fund as well. And then um, we are the uh, largest capital equity center uh, in Asia, second largest capital. And also we have the high, ultra high net wealth people also in Hong Kong. Philanthropies can be the leading one in Asia. And also we have Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, um, Hong Kong um, Stock Exchange, which is Michael, will be um, giving a talk to describe uh, the current latest uh, particular in, in particular for Chapter 18A development in Hong Kong. And then Hong Kong environment, definitely people already know it's a low tax rate in Hong Kong. And then um, from the government perspective, as uh, Stephen mentioned, the government had already spent 150 billion in different innovation technology development in Hong Kong. And from the government side, we have the venture fund, matching fund, and also different uh, programs allow different corporate to do the R&D in Hong Kong, and the tax deduction and also cash rebate, as well as uh, salary subsidized, which is also giving a boost to the R&D function in Hong Kong. So hopefully this gives you a good snapshot about the R&D development, particularly in the life and health science in Hong Kong, and also we have different speaker who is going to address different part of this slide. Thank you. So um, next one, I will pass it on to Mr. Rajiv Bata, who is the president of Hong Kong API, to give us uh, something, um, the latest development about the pharmaceutical industry development in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Hello, everyone. And, uh, before I start, on behalf of um, the Hong Kong API, just a big thank you to Stephen and the Invest Hong Kong group for being able to support such a critical meeting at such a critical time. Now, from a, from a pharma perspective, we're very aware that the, the standard of care that is already available for our patients is very good. And that standard of care comprises of very good generic medicine as well as good innovative medicine. So when we talk about bringing innovation to our patients, we need to really develop medicine that is actually going to provide incremental benefit to what is already there. And it needs to be cost effective, both for the patient, the treating physician and the budget holder. And that's where I think the API has some very aligned objectives to try and support this. We believe that one of the keys 
to moving things forward is precision medicine, where you really think about specific tailored medication, biomarker-based, accompanied by very specific screening and diagnostics to ensure that we have predictable outcomes that justify the cost and provide that incremental benefit. We also believe that there's been a lot of talk about the GBA. It is a fantastic opportunity for Hong Kong. We move from a, a research and development base of 7.4, 7.5 million to 70 million plus. That makes us competitive with most European countries and many markets across the world. But what we must do is now not just talk about the opportunity, we must act and we must act with pace and actually make sure that we now have full operating models in place to realize this opportunity because it's huge. And even for the mainland to provide real world evidence in advance of registrations there, this is a huge opportunity for the industry. But one significant challenge that all companies now face is that from screening molecules to developing them and commercializing them, there is an increasing pressure on patents. And the one thing that we believe we have here in Hong Kong and in GBA, which is advanced compared to most other markets, is we have experts, we have clinical trial centers that can recruit at pace, they can deliver quality, and importantly, they can deliver studies on time. So I think we really need to accelerate the potential that we have. But the one thing that we do have as a challenge, which remains a challenge, is that if we're competing for um, resource, we're competing to be study centers of choice, we must enable a direct correlation between that investment and if we do produce meaningful clinical results, we must drive a stronger correlation between that investment and fast track registration of our medicines to actually reach patients in Hong Kong. So what I would really like to do is call upon all, everyone in this room and everyone watching this, uh, this meeting is to come together to ensure that not only do we project ourselves as really one of the leading biomedical hubs globally based on the potential that we have with the experts that we have, but let's make sure that we incentivize that investment by making sure that we take the studies, we take the medicine, and we actually make sure that our patients actually have access to it faster as a result, because that's why companies will then choose to select us versus other markets around the world. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Wanji. So may I invite the next speaker, Dr. Grace Lau from um, Hong Kong Science and Technology Bank. She's the head of Institute for Translational Research. Dr. Grace, thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, really happy to see um, researchers that I've known for a long time and new ones that I've met in Science Park in the last few months. Uh, but on top of that, lots of friends from the pharma industries that I haven't met for the longest time, maybe last three years. So very happy to be here today. Uh, I used to attend events like this uh, from a different perspective. But uh, the last few months, I joined the Science Park and leading the Institute for Translational Research. Now I have a really good uh, understanding of what we have done uh, along the way, that especially the last few years, by the government, by Science Park, to drive the development of innovation and technology in Hong Kong. And the ITR is focused on biomedical technology. Um, I'll show you in the next, uh, hopefully in 15 minutes, uh, the involvement and what we have done so far in driving or helping uh, the development of a very vibrant ecosystem to help and support or attract our medical technology development in Hong Kong. And by the way, uh, we don't do any research. It's Institute for Translational Research, but we help, we support, and we build whatever is needed to help um, attract startups, incubations, big companies, researchers from the institutes, um, higher education, 
to do the work in Hong Kong, especially on, on site. But uh, we have uh, a lot of expertise in our team, but we don't actually do the research ourselves. Now, just to carry on from uh, what um, uh, we just mentioned, Hong Kong is a very uh, vibrant hub. We have built a good platform and ecosystem to partner with different institutions to drive uh, the development of INT, and especially in the biomedical area. Um, I won't dwell on this because uh, I think the, the, uh, the picture has been described to you. So in ITR, uh, where I've worked in the last few months, uh, we have one big objective, and that's to establish Hong Kong as a preeminent hub for translational research and development in the biomedical area. Now, what we do is we provide um, um, enablers, facilities, etc., cetera, plus, plus also nurture talents to give them an entrepreneurial mindset to take their research from the bench, develop them, commercialize them, and become successful entrepreneurs and develop Hong Kong um, as a vibrant hub for uh, uh, biomedical industry to make it industrialized. Now, I want to give you a snapshot of what we have so far. Uh, in the science park now, we have over a thousand uh, companies already. Now, they come from different countries. Now, out of these 1,000, uh, about 170 are um, biomedical, biomedical focus, and they fall into these areas. Uh, the very familiar ones like pharmaceuticals, but now the trend is to, it's going towards to biologics, um, cell therapy, gene therapy, and we also have Chinese medicine companies who are doing research in, on our park uh, sites. And the other growing very fast areas are diagnostics, are AI assisted, uh, AI drug discovery, et cetera, and medical devices and in vitro diagnostics. So we have a, a bunch of all these companies from very small startups, incubates to well-established companies all on site. So in the next uh, few slides, I want to cover um, a little bit about the core facilities that we, uh, we have built and we'll be also adding to enable all these companies to do good research and to attract even more into Hong Kong. And um, plus a little bit about the uh, programs that we provide. How do we support startups? How do we enable them to get sufficient funding and talents to carry on with their research? Now, first of all, I want to talk about the Incubio program. Now, um, the, the whole Hong Kong Science Park is actually like a big university. Now, only yesterday we celebrated our 20th anniversary. Many of, of you were uh, our, our guests yesterday. So we saw the graduation of over 300 um, teams or companies uh, from incubation and ideation. Now, they need funding. These startups, uh, they have great ideas. They have uh, great initial researchers but they do not have enough funding and support and facilities to do their research. So in incubation is the program that we put in place in uh, Hong Kong Science Park to help these groups. Um, particularly, incubiles are specific for the biomedical technology companies because the life cycle tend to be much longer than other uh, kind of industries. So incubile program is a four-year program we built in place. We provide um, a one-stop biomedical support for these um, startups. Now, when they are admitted, they would get funding, they would get professional services that are already on site. Um, they can use shared facilities and very um, expensive equipments and instruments as well that uh, Hong Kong SP uh, can provide. And we also help them, uh, my colleagues will help them uh, do fundraising, help nurture them, build their mindset to how, do, how would they be able to pitch their business to investors, like some of you um, uh, in the audience. Now, after four years, successfully meeting all milestones, we call them, they have graduated. And hopefully they would become our tenants. They already have some products which are going into the clinical phase, continue to develop and commercialize. The other program that I wanted to mention uh, is called incubation. Now we have incubates. We need big established companies uh, pharma, biopharma, medical devices companies, uh, well established to be our co-incubators to provide guidance, mentorship, and sometimes they give investment or even uh, buy up the technology as well. So this one was the very first one that was uh, signed between um, Hong Kong Science Park and AstraZeneca as our first co-incubator program uh, uh, 
for our startups. Now, following that, we have signed up several. Um, in the diagnostic areas, we have KingMed, which is a very well-established diagnostic company, big business in China. Um, AstraZeneca has a focus on oncology. And we also have one, uh, we publicized it as well with Boehringer Ingelheim, the Venture Fund. So they have a, a focus on infectious disease, immunology, but they also do investment. So they selectively will um, be introduced to our startup companies, uh, understand their needs, and if they are really the good ones, they would actually do the investment. So this is uh, some examples. And my vision is to build a panel of co-incubators, all the big companies, they would be the um, uh, in our ecosystem as well, and to drive, support Hong Kong's growth of biomedical technology from startups and helping them to grow and have insights how to uh, become a, a commercially viable company. Now, next, I want to give you a snapshot very quickly what has been built in the last few years. Um, I wasn't. Uh, aware that so much has been done in Science Park in the last few years. Now we have um, uh, all these facilities to help our startups, incubators, or smaller size companies. They don't have enough funding to buy a very expensive 4 million Hong Kong dollar piece of equipment to do um, you know, sequencing, for example. But uh, with our support, they're able to use, use them on site. They just need to book, make a booking, and they can use it on site. Um, so we have our proteomic um, labs, uh, co-working labs, now it's come, come to um, 3.0 already, so we keep on um, building new ones. Uh, flow cytometry and even the bio incubates, they have specific working labs that they, they can use. And more and more these days, uh, startups are used doing genomic studies, imaging, so we have uh, a specific genomic labs as well. For the medical devices industry or uh, the startups, they may not need to use very big space. So we have uh, some smaller co-working office space that would allow them to use very uh, little, you know, very low budget and still be able to work in a very vibrant uh, environment uh, in Science Park. Now, this is a uh, something that has been developed in the last uh, couple of years, one or two years. So understanding the need for um, biologics or the research in that area and earlier stage research. So uh, Science Park built a biobank uh, with histopathology um, capability. They can help our researchers to do uh, sections, do um, you know, dig digital screening, uh, et cetera. And we have a big repository to help you store the samples. Um, there's also a platform uh, biomedical informatics platform, we call it BIP, which is for sharing the biomedical um, data. And we are hoping one day we would be building a platform where all very important and very useful healthcare data can be shared on a very secure platform, and we can all use that and share that in a secure manner and, div uh, and uh, produce more useful information or decision that can help us manage our healthcare uh, in even better. Now, the latest um, facility is the Drug Safety Testing Center, because the, that the DSC. In Hong Kong right now, there's still no GLP certified accredited site for animal studies. So this, this will be the first one that uh, we hope will get GLP certification from US FDA, uh, Europe, and also NMPA, all in one uh, in our center. Um, that probably will take another uh, more than a year uh, or 18 months, but this is on the way already. And uh, another one for testing medical devices and also a GMP facility for uh, cell, cell therapy ATMP products. So just a snapshot. Uh, right now, uh, with the new ATMP regulations in Hong Kong, we need specific GMP certified place to do cell manufacturing. Um, back in at, at least two, more than two years ago, we um, co-worked with the two universities, Hong Kong U and CUHK, to um, collaborate to build a state-of-the-art PIX GMP cell processing um, facilities. Now, um, with the delay in the last year because of, the, of COVID and everything, now we're hopefully we'll get that um, approved towards the end of this year or very early next year. So that would become a place where 
cell therapy can be manufactured under the GMP certification. And uh, training for personnel is most important. So I, I spoke to some of you in the audience. We really need to have more talents, especially driving in this area. This talents, knowing how to do cell therapy manufacturing is far and few between. We cannot just import them. We need to grow and develop our talents. So hopefully you can join force together in this direction. Uh, I won't dwell on that. This is the very first GLP, and we want to get uh, ALAC and also uh, GLP certification from all the important regions in the world. So it's just some nice pictures. Okay, two programs. I just want to use a few minutes to talk about programs. Now, knowing that some startups, their molecules or cell therapy or even medical devices, they need to go from bench to bedside. Now, some of them have no idea how to prepare for IND. Now, even if they file IND, it's very difficult to do clinical trials here in Hong Kong. So with that need, we prepared um, this program called CTC, Clinical, Tri clinical Translational Catalyst. Now, this is open to our companies in Science Park. They can apply for this program with funding, specifically for regulatory or for clinical trials. And it can be some substantial, as you see on the slide. But apart from just funding this CTC uh, on site, we also provide regulatory um, expertise. Um, we match the, the investment, we give them funding, but they would also need to input their own resources, hopefully bring them safely through the bench to bedside journey. The other program we developed is called MedTech Co-Create. We really want to foster the cooperation, collaboration on site. Uh, two companies on site, they can design something that they would, they would want to do together and develop a, a project and they can apply for a funding under this MedTech Co-Create program. This is to really to stimulate the, the adoption and co-creation. And this is really the thinking for startups and entrepreneurs. They need to uh, work together in the ecosystem. Uh, I won't dwell on that. We have other things like we need to uh, drive adoption as well. So we have a Geron Tech platform driving all the technology that can be um, adopted. And we work with the hospital authority as well and providing them with technology from the park area that uh, would be suitable to be adopted in the uh, hospital authority. So wrapping up, um, a lot of companies, much larger number are in the ideation incubation phase. Now when they are able to go pr uh, prove uh, themselves, their research can go further, they go into the acceleration phase and, the, and they become a more or less successful company, they become elite. Uh, we have spe special programs which are supporting the acceleration phase, again, a similar, similar approach, funding as well as expertise and expert guidance and introduce them to investment. An elite program, an even bigger one, very substantial. So I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, so if you uh, are interested, I can talk for hours on, on this because uh, our main aim is to attract more researchers going into the biomedical industry, do them in Hong Kong, nurture them, grow them, fill them up with um, things that they, they need in order to um, develop further. Now, these two slides are on investment. This is not my area of expertise. If my companies, they need funding and they're good for um, pitching, my colleagues from the capital team, they would go to talk to them, help them out, what kind of funding they need. Are they in series ABC? Uh, how do we, um, and, and Hong Kong STV actually also do our own investment. So uh, I will leave it to this expert to talk about investment later. And uh, quickly, just to wrap up, we have talent programs as well. This is one key area that we really, really need to put effort from STEM education in pre-tertiary to in tertiary, not just the science subjects, but also in entrepreneurship, uh, our mindset, et cetera, to uh, when they go into the industry, into research, how do they translate? into something that can be commercialized. So I won't go into that. Uh, we, my team also do um, specific education to nurture them. So to wrap up, what we do in ITR in Science Park is we want to help all the researchers to cross over the valley of death 
and we provide all this support so that they can safely turn from bed to bedside and also to commercialization. So I want to thank you. Uh, I have to do that very, very quickly because I can talk for hours about uh, what we would like to do more and to drive Hong Kong into the hub of innovation and technology, especially in the biomedical area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lau, for the introduction. Um, this is what we have today. So what we are looking forward will be the Hong Kong Central Innovation and Technology Park, which will be three times the size of the current Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Um, the next speaker will be um, Mr. Patrick Siu, CEO of Hong Kong Central Innovation and Technology Park. May I invite Patrick? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, professors and old friends here. And um, after hearing what Helen just said, I think I have to do this quicker. We, we, lead, we lead the Lakes Park to continue with all your works. Um, first of all, I'm not a biomedical man, and my company is not a tech company, but we are commissioned to develop the largest INT platform for Hong Kong. So the park here, That's, that's the park. Um, it's, it's in the lofton boundary of Hong Kong to the, to the south of the Samjian River. Originally, it was before 1997, it was a piece of land in the Samjian side. But after the Samjian River was strict, after the Samjian, originally the river was this, and this part of land belongs to Samjian. After 1997, the river, the Samjian River becomes here after we strengthen it and it becomes a part of Hong Kong side. So we are on the Hong Kong land. You don't need a special permit to go into that site. It's our, it's, you just can go into it. It's a construction site now. And, um, but we carry the Samjian DNA. Originally it was Samjian land. So it's 88 hectares of land uh, we just mentioned is about four times the size of Science Park. And on the to the loft of the Samjian River, the Samjian government is going to redevelop the Wang Gang area and the Fuk Tian Free Trade Zone into the new Samjian I and T Song. So together with the Samjian I and T Song, we'll form the He Tao Samjian I and T Cooperation Zone. So that that together is a cooperation song, but, but it's, uh, uh, I'll talk about the one song, two parts concept later. In the CE's uh, policy address last year, she mentioned to announce the development of the Lofton Metropolitan. And there is a 30,000 hectares, uh, 30,000 hectares of land, uh, it's a large development. And in the center part is the Suntin Teleco, which um, the Director General just mentioned, is, is an important INT zone. The government reserved 150 hectares of land for INT use. That is not just for r and it, it will promote uh, reindustrialization and also uh, encourage uh, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing within that zone. So that makes the whole ecosystem larger together there will be about 550 hectares of IT land to be provided in this area. So given that strategic location and, and the Samjian DNA, uh, we, we take on the role, we take on an important role to uh, recognize by the central government. In the outline development plan of the Greater Bay Area announced in 2019, it supports the development of the two sides of the government, the Samjian government and the Hong Kong government, to set up special cooperation, cooperation platforms on the two sides. And later, in 2021, in the 14th five-year plan, it indicates clear support for Hong Kong to develop into an international INT hub. And also, it highlights that the uh, Samjian and Hong Kong cooperation zone to be one of the four major cooperation platforms in the Greater Bay Area. 
So in order to realize the one song, two parks concept, the two governments announced that we listed the cooperation arrangement for the establishment of the uh, two, the cooperation song. It mainly emphasized the facilitation of efficient flow of I and T resources between the two parks. So that, that leads a lot of policy innovation to make that happen. Otherwise, it's just a, a slogan. We, we have to make that happen. In the same year, the two government released the joint policy package uh, for, the, for the loop. So it, again, it emphasized to facilitate efficient flow of talents. That is important. People talk about the research samples, uh, reagents, and also genetic results. Uh, investment and data investment. All this needs a lot of government to government talk in order to make that happen, but is in the joint policy package. So we have a more roadmap to follow. Given this high level directions for Hong Kong to uplift, uh, for, for, for the park to uplift Hong Kong's competitive, uh, we will. We, we try to build open collaboration platform, uh, test bed to, to, so that to support applied researchers into the industry's uh, solutions. I won't talk too much about this. And this is embedded, the, our core functions is embedded in the MOU cited by the two governments uh, in 2017. Our main function is still R&D, supported by higher education and cultural creative industries. Um, that we hope with the higher education incorporated into this, this large area uh, of uh, this large platform, it will collaborate um, more collaboration between tech companies, universities, educations, and also the, uh, so that for con um, translation of the R&D outcomes. Initially, we will focus on six tech areas. And today, we talk about the healthcare technologies, which is um, the topic of this um, uh, seminar. Um, that is not a vertical, single technologies. It incorporates, it's interrelated with others, like big data, AI, robotics. And we are researching into this, uh, all these areas and talking to all the stakeholders. So with, in the last two years, we have been talking to visiting a lot of universities in Hong Kong and also the labs, in the Hong Kong labs and also the people to solicit what they want. And we compile this wish list. If we can transform this wish list into, into realities, that will be our good value proposition. At the moment, it's only our, our wish list. That still needs uh, a lot of support from the governments to make this happen. Um, people want to have access, convenient access to talents and r and teams from both sides, like the Hong Kong side and the Samjian side, the Greater Bay Area, and access to, to the uh, biotech facilities within the cooperation zone. Uh, also talk about standards and regulatory bodies. And also, the, to make a success, release some innovative policies and, and pilot initiatives. If we just do it as a business as usual initiative, we do it uh, on, on the Hong Kong side, and, and the Samjian is doing their own part, it won't be a cooperation zone. So that leads a lot of um, this collaboration between Samjian and Hong Kong to make this happen. Luckily, the CE also announced in her, in her policy address last year that we shall develop the Inno Life Health Tech Hub in the loop. And that will, of course, that will involve all the um, uh, Inno Life Health Tech related labs um, and also the state key labs in life and health disciplines and also the life science industries. And also, the government also research, uh, earmarked $10 billion to support this uh, innovative uh, Inno Hong Kong clusters. Trying is aiming to develop Hong Kong into a major r and hub in science and health um, disciplines. Uh, in view of time, let me go to what, so that you can see after I talk so much. This is what we, we are trying to build. There are 67 buildings on it. We are going to build it in different batches. 
The Science Park at Park Sec Court now has 23 buildings, and we used it um, 20 years to build it. If by that standard, if by that program, we need 60 years to develop this park, uh, which when I talk to my, my counterparts in Samjian, they just opened their eyes and said, okay, um, the, the loop program was announced in the 14th five-year plan. If they mention it again in the 15th five-year plan, you will be sacked. So we got to do it quicker. At the moment, we only got funding from government to do the first eight buildings here. And we are doing the first eight buildings from the, from, from the west because this is the entry, uh, the entrance to the, to the park. The Long Mato MTR station is over there. It's one kilometer away. So initially, we have all these uh, connections into this park. Eventually, we'll be building batches by batches. This is divided into six batches at the moment, all integrated together under an uh, integrated basement uh, design. Uh, it's, it, it was the last slide that we talked about the smart city concept and, and all, the, all the future controls in, in this park. Um, what I wish to add is that the Director General also mentioned connectivities. When, when, he, when he mentioned the Suntin telephone. That is very important because the, the first station from, from uh, uh, Wang Gang into Hong Kong will be here. This will be the Lok Ma Zhou station, the Lok Ma Zhou Loop station, I don't know how it's called. Uh, the government hasn't announced it, but, but it's all already in the newspaper in the plan that there will be uh, a spur line coming this way into the MTR, um, into the loop. So luckily we have left an open space there so that I can accommodate MTR to build the station over there. But it takes a lot of uh, modification. I have to change my basement, I have to do a lot of things uh, over there to, to make it happen. If you look at this, this park, 67 buildings, 1.2 million square meters of GFA, and uh, we are hoping to get it higher. So we are thinking about, uh, we, we should have over 50,000 INT posts inside this park. It is not just talking about hardware, it's how to fill it up, how to make a platform from this park. At the moment, it's like this. Um, we are doing the foundations. The first two, the first three buildings, the foundations, uh, we are doing so, we are doing it quickly so that even the government hasn't completed the sewage treatment plant, we have to do our own temporary sewage treatment plant here in order to start early. So we are hoping to complete these three buildings in 2025, 2024, 2025. And then the remaining building will be, will be coming on stream in the next two or, two or three years. Uh, this is my program at the moment. The remaining 59 buildings still relies on how we develop our business model. We may be talking to, we, we may have uh, government funding for the remaining buildings. We may have parlor, parlor building the buildings for them, uh, buildings them, and we can cooperate to do, to this, to, to do this building. So, I assure you, it won't take 60 years. Okay, thank you. We move on to the next major part, which is about the Inner you know, Hong Kong Health. And uh, we are very pleased to have a Dr. Kerry Ling to be the moderator for the whole section. So please, Dr. Thank you, Andy. And then, um... So may I have a first slide? Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is my great honor to represent HASTP uh, to uh, give you an overview about the Inu HK cluster at the Hong Kong Science Park. So Inu HK was mentioned it during the uh, on the news recently, and then during the visit of uh, President uh, Xi Jinping, visit at the Science Park on uh, June 30. And uh, you can see that, um, so uh, the presidency uh, visited um, 
uh, the Hong Kong Science Park and met with some of the uh, Hong Kong scientists, academics, uh, innovators, and young entrepreneurs. And our CEO, Albert Wong, has also introduced the city's seven top innovations to the presidency. And uh, as you know that there's a one of the seven top innovation is one of them is developed by Professor Dennis Do also here, uh, who is the scientific director of the Center for Nophotics that showcased his award winning prenatal test for the um, uh, genetic disease to the president. And then after that uh, showcases and then um, uh, presidency visited also the Hong Kong uh, Center for uh, neurodegenerative diseases during an inspections tour of the Hong Kong Science Park. And then you can see that um, uh, our um, ex, um, uh, chief executive, Carrie Lam, Carrie Lam, is also there. And you can see that, um, so uh, it is a uh, great honor for Hong Kong Science Park to host this visit. And then so everyone know more about uh, InnoHK afterward. And you may ask what InnoHK is, and then so thanks uh, Stephen uh, Phillips, and then mentioned a little bit about the overview of the InnoHK already. And then so uh, if you um, remember this uh, in the policy address in 2018, and then uh, the policy address, uh, the Hong Kong government embarked the 10 billion Hong Kong dollar, and then to fund the fashioned innovation technology project, and then to develop the Hong Kong as the hub for the global research collaborations. So in this InnoHK initiative, there's a two area. One is health at InnoHK, and also another is the air of InnoHK. For health at InnoHK, it's focused more on the health technology, and then uh, well, the um, air for InnoHK focused more on the AI and robotics. And for all this, um, uh, Innovation Initiative launch. That's why we received a lot of applications from the ITC and then to have the uh, project proposal. And then in which that um, after the workers selections, there's a 28 project was funded by the uh, uh, ITC uh, Innovation Technology Commission in this case. And after that, in 2020, we started to have launched the first open the first uh, center at the science park. And then so uh, becoming that we have the official launch ceremony back to the uh, May 25th of uh, 2000, uh, 2022 this year. And so you can see that we just officially launched and then so we have more uh, promotion and marketing activity for InnoHA from now on. For this launching um, uh, uh, ceremony that we launched the InnoHA logo and also that you can see that the InnoHA uh, web, uh, uh, website over here, then you can, if you are interested to know more about the, um, uh, the research area for uh, all this InnoHA center, then you can go to this uh, website. Okay, so um, for the InnoHK Research Center, we have the health at InnoHK and also the air of InnoHK. And then there's a 28 research center that we can say half of them funded by the health uh, cluster, another is the air cluster. For all these 28 uh, research center, for health center that we, they received the funding around uh, 300 to 500 million Hong Kong dollar for each center for five year budget for AR center around like uh, 200 to 300 million Hong Kong dollar. And all of this center uh, were led by um, the local universities, uh, six university, and also um, Hong Kong Productivity Council and the Chinese Academy of Science. The um, uh, uniqueness of this center is that they have to uh, partner with the overseas collaborators. So from uh, like uh, uh, 30 plus, uh, we learned that, uh, um, overseas institutions, for example, like Stanford, NIT, uh, Harvard, Cambridge, Pasteur, Oxford, etc. And for the health cluster, that are basically that uh, they have, a, we can categorize in the forming areas that they are focused. They develop the novel therapeutic in oncology and eye, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, muscular de uh, degenerative diseases, and also infection diseases. And also the another area focused more on the stem cell in regenerative medicine uh, and also some of the advanced medical devices, uh, lead generation diseases, diagnostic and the monitoring, etc. For the AI R Center, and I think that um, so then they focus more on the robotic in medicine, constructions and logistics. Another area focused more on the AI in the integrated circuit 
design, fintech, green tech, and also the health data analytics. So the last but not least, they focus also on the reliability and safety. And so this is a one of the um, picture that we took, uh, I think, and a year ago at the Hong Kong Science Park. So a uh, while wow, that uh, most of the center move in and then we have a party and then so, and then to uh, just have a picture and then to get all the innovation center together. Okay, so uh, as uh, um, Stephen Phillips mentioned that there's uh, 16 healthcare related center, innovation center. So you can see that there's uh, 14 of them that's from health as NHK, another two from air of NHK. So for the air of NHK, we have the uh, multi-scale medical uh, robotic centers, MLC. Another is uh, the laboratory of the data discovery of health, um, uh, D square for H. And of all, for all of these centers, so uh, seven were fund, uh, so led by the Hong Kong U, so including uh, the advanced uh, biomedical instrumentation centers, center for uh, um, uh, immunology and infection disease that um, so Professor Leo Poon will uh, present it later on, and also the um, Center for Virology and uh, Vaseology uh, uh, um, uh, Center as well. And also another is the Center for Oncology and Immunology, and also that uh, so for laboratory for synthetic chemistry and chemical biology uh, laboratory as well. Another is for the more focus on the translation stem cell biology. So those are seven other Hong Kong U centers. Another four is from CHK. So the one that led by uh, Center uh, Professor Denaso Center for Robotics. Another one led by um, uh, Professor Xiu Ng and also Professor Chan, Francis Chen also here today. And then so is uh, um, Michael Baalta Eye Center Magic. Another one is the uh, Center for uh, Leo Musculoskeletal Restorative Medicine Limited, which is led by um, Professor Patrick Young as well. So another center that um, uh, that is from UST is uh, led by um, Professor um, uh, Lancy Yip, uh, Hong Kong Center for the Neurodegenerative Diseases that Professor Xi visited uh, a few days ago. And also that we have the one that led by Hong Kong Baptist University that called it the Center for um, uh, Chinese Herbal Medicine uh, Drug Development Limited. And also another one led by um, Professor Ben Thompson, ben Thompson and also Professor Chi Ho Cho, and then so Center for Eye and Vision Research. And then so Ben will share with you more about uh, his center later on as well. Another one is uh, from CTU called the um, Hong Kong Center for the uh, Central, Central um, uh, Cardiovascular Engineering Center, and also that for the Regenerative Center led by the uh, Chinese Academy of Science as well. So all of these centers that uh, will build the foundation for uh, Hong Kong as the uh, international INT hub for our biotech sectors. So uh, we are so um, uh, Honor to have all four speakers today from our uh, four centers Center for Lophotics, uh, Magic, C2I, and also CIFR. And then uh, uh, to have the speaker today to share with us more about the introductions of their center, about their uh, uh, center, what's their research, what they are doing. Without further ado, maybe um, I invite our first speaker of today, Professor Dennis Lopez. Um, so Ku is the scientific director of the Center for Lophotics and also the Li Ka-Shing professor of the uh, medicine of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. His research interests focus on the biology and diagnostic applications of, for the cell three leukeic acids in plasma. In particular, he discovered the presence of the cell three uh, fetal DNA in the maternal plasma in 1997 and has since then has been pioneering uh, the non-invasive prenatal diagnosis using this technology. This technology has been adopted globally and has created a paradigm in the prenatal medicine. It's also made many innovations using the circulating nuclear acids for the cancer detection, including the screening of the early stage uh, nasal physiological cancer as well. So may I welcome Professor Daniel Lopez. So good morning. 
It's my honor and privilege to present in front of this distinguished audience. So my center is called the Center for Novostics, which just means novel diagnostics. So our center currently has uh, 50 uh, scientists. Uh, many of us are clinician scientists, actually mainly pathologists. Uh, and also because we work in the genomics area, so we also have uh, many bioinformaticians and also clinical geneticists. So we actually collaborate internationally. Uh, we work with the University of Oxford, uh, Imperial College, and the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. Uh, we're based on uh, in the Science Park in this uh, lovely building, 18Y, with a really nice uh, sea view, which is very inspiring to our work. Uh, so my primary research area is actually to look at DNA molecules which are swimming in our blood, the so-called plasma DNA. So uh, our group actually first reported in 1997 that during pregnancy, a fetus will release its DNA into the bloodstream of mother. Actually, this fetal DNA represents about 5 to 10% of the circulating DNA. And actually, we have then developed this into a platform of non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT for short. So in other words, in the old days, if a mother wanted to know whether her baby is healthy or not, like whether they have chromosomes or genetic disorders, we have to stick a big needle into the uterus in a process called amniocentesis, which has some risk. But now with the invention of NIPT, all we need to do is to take a blood sample from the mother and we're able to test the chromosomes or DNA of the fetus. And actually, NIPT is surprisingly accurate. For example, if you try to screen for Down syndrome, the diagnostic accuracy is over 99%. Now, because it's so accurate, there's naturally been very rapidly adopted globally. And there's actually millions of pregnant women are benefiting from this technology every year. Now, for example, in Hong Kong, I estimate about 85% of pregnant women actually go through this test. Actually, hospital authority have provided this test free of charge since 2019. And then we're thinking, when a baby is growing inside mother, it's actually quite similar to a cancer growing in a patient. So we have also, at the same time, developed a parallel set of technology to detect cancer DNA in the circulation. And we have actually developed this into a set of technologies to screen for multiple types of cancer. So this technology has now been licensed to a company called Grail, of which I'm a scientific co-founder. Actually, Grail now has a test which can screen for 50 types of cancer in one go. And Grail was acquired by Illumina last year. So what we're thinking now is, what is the next step? And actually, it, and so what's the next generation of this sort of test? Now, one thing is this. Now, if you look at our genome, the DNA in our cell, if you stick it all together, every cell has DNA of the length of about two meters long. But interestingly, in our circulation, the DNA are being cut by some molecular scissors into tiny fragments. Now, for example, if you're being quantitative and try to measure those fragments, so on the x-axis are those fragments. Now, our genome is 3 billion base pair, which is very long. But the fragments in our blood is about a couple of hundred base pair, or 150, that's of area. And interestingly, you can also see that the fragment, for example, in pregnancy, the fetal DNA, which is plotted in blue, is actually a little bit shorter than the mother's DNA, which is in red. And so because of that, we have actually developed a new technology, which we can actually detect fetal abnormalities by measuring the size of the molecules. We call this size-based diagnostics. And furthermore, apart from measuring the size, as you can see in this molecule on the left-hand side, we find that molecular scissors, when it cuts, it will recognize certain motif. And just by sequencing, instead of the whole DNA molecule, just sequence the end, say four of those code, which will make the test very cheap, I can already tell whether this fragment is likely coming from a fetus or coming from cancer. And furthermore, if we look at the right-hand side of that molecule, like some scissors, let's say you go for a haircut, and some scissors, when they cut, they'll give a very sharp edge. And sometimes, some other scissors will give you a jacket end. 
And interestingly, we find that by using this jacket N, or jackedness, we can differentiate if a molecule of DNA slightly come from cancer, from fetus, or some other organs in the body. So overall now, this technology is called fragmentomics. Now, apart from fragmentomics, we've also discovered that some of the circling DNA molecule could be linear, and some could be circular, like a ring. So we call that topology. So we've recently actually summarized our thought in this article in Science. Now, when we're measuring the DNA molecules in blood, of course, we need a ruler. And one thing we're wondering, is it possible that your ruler could somehow affect what you see? Just like if I see the world with a, a glass, a pair of glasses with a red color, then the whole world look red to me. So now with the observational tool, might affect what we see. And conventionally, when we look at DNA in blood, most people will use the market leader, which is a sequencer made by Illumina. But the Illumina sequencer will only see short molecules. Anything above 600 base pair is invisible. But now on the market, there's a generation of new sequencers, which is called single molecule sequencer or third generation sequencer. Now, for example, one of those is made by this company called Pacific Bioscience. And we've been asking ourselves, what would happen if we use one of those new sequencers to take a look and measure the size of molecules in blood? Would we see anything that we can't see before? Now, so this is the old vision when you use Illumina. Very short molecules, 200 base pair, that's it. But interestingly, when we actually start to use a third generation sequencer, we start to see all these molecules in blue, which are invisible before. And those guys are very long, you know, several thousand units long. And actually, they're quite frequent. For example, you look at the median value in the first trimester of pregnancy. We're talking about 15%. Second trimester go to 20%. Third trimester, 30%. So in, my, in other words, for the last 25 years, we've been ignoring and wasting this information. Now, one thing is that if I look at your genome and my genome, every 1,000 base pair, there may be a difference, the so-called polymorphisms. But in the old days, if you look at short molecules, you need to look at eight or 10 molecules before you have a chance to find one molecule which tells you the difference between you and I, or the baby and the mother. But now, with the long molecule, one is enough. So for example, here I show you a fetal DNA molecule, which is 16,000 units long. So one molecule, as you can see from the bottom, I can decode A, C, T, C, et cetera, all the differences between the baby and the mother. So what this means is, is that long DNA diagnostic is very efficient. Now, for example, in the old days, our group is actually the first one to decode the whole genome of a baby from mother's blood. We actually did this in 2010. And we developed this method, which is very accurate to decoding it, called relative haplotype dosage, RIDO. But the problem is it's very expensive. You need to analyze 4 billion reads to get it, the answer. But now, if I use the new technology, which is in red, the old technology is in blue. You can see the, the new technology, I can get the answer within, say, 30 million reads, which is actually much more effective. And actually, this work is very new. We actually just published it over Christmas last year. Now, just now I told you, there's a similarity between the fetus and cancer. So next question, of course, can we see long cancer DNA in, in the blood? And we have actually recently just published it about one month ago. And the answer is yes. Now, for example, we can look at the HCC patient, which means liver cancer patient, chronic hepatitis B carrier, or even healthy individuals. There's a median of 15 to 20% of serum DNA are long molecules. So the analogy is like this. For the last 25 years in this field, it's almost like I'm in texting you. So I can only text you, say, 10 characters or 20 characters. But now, with the discovery of long cell free DNA, for the first time, I can send you a whole Word document to read. We're very pleased, actually, that our work has been acknowledged internationally. For example, last year, 
I was fortunate enough to win the Breakthrough Prize and also win also the Royal Medal, which is the first time that a Chinese group has won it since uh, 1825. And also we have been very uh, diligently trying to file patents. Uh, for example, every year, Nature Biotechnology will rank the 20 groups in the world with the most patent, which are most cited. Uh, we're very fortunate for the last five years, we were on this group. So this year, we were actually ranked number seven and also 13. But of course, if you look at the other people on the group, now we have Jennifer Dutner, who won a Nobel Prize for inventing CRISPR. And then we also have Bob Langer, who is a founded many companies as well as a Moderna. And you also have a Beyond Tech group as number two. So we'll work, continue to work out in this area. So in summary, I believe that plasma DNA diagnostics is a treasure trove in molecular medicine. With this new long cell-free DNA diagnostics and fragmentomics marker, we can see details which we cannot see before, and we should have many research and commercial applications. So finally, I'd like to thank my group for generating the data which I present to you today, and also thank the InnoHK to support our work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo. And uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Siu Ng, who is the director of the uh, 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 Microbiota Eye Center, MAGIC. And then uh, she is also the professor at the Department of the Medicine and Therapeutic, assistant in development of CHK, and also the honorary consultant physician at the Prince of the Wales Hospital. And in 2019, um, Professor Siu Ng and Professor Francis Chen, they co-founded a biotech startup company, Gini Biome, which is also one of the Inkyo bio, uh, bio company from the HASTP. Um, as the um, non-executive board of scientific director and scientific advisor of the company, Professor Ng still the research and development of the uh, microbiome diagnostic and therapeutics. Uh, let's join us to uh, uh, a big hand for the Professor Phil Ng. Thank you very much, Carrie. So we all know what magic is, but I think what I'm going to tell you today really is the magic within you. I'm going to take you through a journey of the Microbiota Innovation Center, stands for magic. So my partner in crime is here today, Professor Francis Chan, who is also the Dean of Medicine at UHK. And both of us are gastroenterologists. So the story started that we wanted to untackle the mystery behind what sits inside our gut, the trillions of microbiome that are invisible to our naked eye. And this opportunity arises with Eno Center when we can transform these scientific discoveries to commercial commodities. So our mission is very simple. It's really to bring health and hope for our future generation by translating human gut microbiome into effective diagnostics and therapeutics. Now, the word gut microbiome is really not new to the world. It's now the buzzword, for example, in TV talk shows, it's cropped into the front page of Nature, the Scientists, and has entered the commercial commodity in The Economist and The New York Times. In fact, the recent Bloomberg projection is that the CRG growth in terms of percentage for the microbiome biotech is going to be close to 50% by 2026. So I think this is an exciting time. Well, what it transpired is that each one of you here has 20,000 human DNA. But what you may not know is you have close to 20 million bacteria DNA. So in other words, we are all more microbes than human. These are all good bugs inside us. So if you count the number of genes you have in your body, you're only 1% human. Well, you may not really care about these figures, but I think what you would care about is that in the last decade, we now know that almost any human disease you can think of in some magnitude are related to some abnormality in the gut microbiome, ranging from cancer to chronic diseases in children, such as autism, and even recently, COVID-19. And I'm sure in this room, every one of you will have families or friends or someone who have been affected by one or many of these conditions before. So 
the question is our innovation comes from just taking one teaspoon of stool from you with the ability to predict your risk of disease. Now, this is a new generation of what we call fecal bacteria DNA diagnostics. If you take that one spoon of stool, we can generate valuable data that can fill a dozen of DVDs, in fact, meaningful data that we know a lot more about. So the next time you are in the toilet taking a data dump before you flush that down, I just want you to think about how what you're about to flush down may save your life one day. You may think that I'm crazy now, but I'm going to show you that I'm not at the end of this talk. This is happening. So in order to do this, I mean, our team has built in the last five years one of the most comprehensive microbial metagenomics data sets through aluminal sequencing. We sequence the DNA of the bacteria, and now we can characterize. We know down to the string level who they are, what they do, who their families are, I mean, the microbes or the friends or their foes. And because of this characterization, we can manipulate them. What I didn't tell you earlier on is it's a bit hard to manipulate the 1% of the genes that you inherit for your fa from your father and mother, but we can manipulate the bacteria genes by a lot of measures. Our first innovation is called M3. This is a technology that detects colon cancer when it can be cured. So 90% of colon cancer develops from this small lesion we call polyp inside your colon. And over time, it becomes cancer. Right now, there's no non-invasive way to actually detect the small lesions. So by using bacterial gene sequencing and PCR, we've identified, for example, four key markers that can give you a risk score to predict your risk of colon cancer. We tested it in clinical studies, and you could see the sensitivity of 94% close enough to the gold standard of a colonoscopy. And not only that, it can also detect the small polyps and the large polyps better and more superior the conventional stool account blood test. Not only that, this is currently the first test, M3, that can detect recurrence of adenoma. What happens is when you have a polyp there on the left that's been removed through colonoscopy, 40% will have recurrence of this lesion in the next few years. Right now, the only way to detect that is again to have a colonoscopy, which is invasive. But using a stool biomarker, which like what Mr. Bartik rightly said, we need monitoring too. We need biomarkers that can actually help us survey our patients better and personalize our treatment. And this can actually have a detection of recurrence of adenoma up to 90%. Well, you may think that this technology is limited to disease of the gut only, but we're now exploring its utilization in other conditions that affect the brain, like autism, because of the gut-brain axis. So our first generation prototype, again, is a stool test using short gut metagenomic sequencing based on five bacterial markers for us to predict the risk of autism spectrum disorder in children. This is expensive, so we're building a second generation going to duplex qPCR assays for translational application. It is not perfect, but it will be the only, I think, non-invasive diagnostic way of detecting autistic risk before a children actually has it. Right now, there's no such tool, and you really have to rely on the clinician to make that diagnosis by the time your child turns six years old. So M3 is now commercially available. It's been launched in Hong Kong and in the medical centers and private clinics and the autism diagnostic will be launched later this year when it's ready. So Francis and I are not only contented in actually provide early diagnosis, we really want to provide a solution to patients as well. And as I said earlier on, you can change your gut microbiome. So in 2020, in the news feature, a lot of early investment are now looking at microbiome therapeutics. And I think this is because we're beginning to see clinical trial success or positive studies. So we had an opportunity during COVID-19 to have this low hanging fruit because patients come into Prince of Wales Hospital. We track the gut microbiome and serially look at them and sequence them over the course of the stay. And during this time, we are able to identify why some people get COVID-19, why they end up in hospital, why they die from it because they have some certain missing bacteria in the gut that helps us boost immunity. And what we've done is now through big data, 
as well as machine learning, identify and develop a new product called SIM01. This product we tested in clinical studies, and we found that in patients with COVID-19, you actually have more rapid resolution of symptoms, as well as you develop neutralizing antibody to this uh, bacteria or the sorry the virus more rapidly. So we are now doing two randomized controlled trials in Hong Kong of about a thousand people, a phase two trials, looking at the use of SIM01 to boost immunity, to increase antibody response following COVID-19 vaccine, as well as to reduce the risk of long COVID. Sadly, I think we are here to live with SARS-CoV-2 virus and new variants will keep coming. But I think we need ways to complement vaccination for now in order to help us have better life. So SIM01 again has been had an IP that's been exclusively licensed to Genibiome, a startup with myself and Francis. And this is now commercially available in Southeast Asia as well as in Hong Kong. But we also have a next generation of anti-colon cancer biotherapeutics that has been launched recently as well. So uh, we're very pleased to have received you know, to go and silver awards at the Geneva um, Inventions recently for some of these products. So the last part I want to talk about is what I told you is using single bacterial strain or multibacterial strain that may not be a solution for complex diseases. There are complex diseases that you need to change the whole gut flora. And by that, this is the revolution of fecal microbiota transplantation to extract the microbiome from a healthy person and transfer it to a diseased person. This is now FDA approved as an IND in America for the key treatment for a deadly condition, a life-threatening condition called Clostridium difficile infection, which caused 40% death, 75% recurrence. With just one infusion of fecal transplant, the cure rate is close to 90%. So rather miraculous. This started in ancient China, where you feed food poisoning people with um, stew for someone who is healthy. So right now, in terms of the societal impact, Magic will be the sole provider of fecal microbiota transplantation to the whole hospital authority in Hong Kong for this infection. But what's more important is that we know that C. diff is still quite rare in Hong Kong but it is also applicable to other chronic diseases. And we are testing it in diabetes, graft versus disease, obesity, as well as inflammatory bowel disease. For example, we now have patterns of families. FMT has no inventions that people are doing worldwide. But what we want to know is what inside this fecal material that is special, that can help create success. We are now able to push the success rate of outcome, for example, from 70% close to 90% or from 50% to 80%. So we have a stool bank at Magic. It stores about 130K valves or specimens. And what is more important, I think was alluded again by Mr. Barty, is we are now not able to scale our FMT because it needs endoscopy to produce. So we are making them into pills. You may like to call it poop pills or crap pills, but eventually I think the most important is they are the healthy microbiome making for a special, a dedicated person with a dedicated disease. So our collaborators are University of Cambridge, Chicago, as well as Melbourne. And we also have built a network in the Greater Bay Area for the next, uh, for the last few years. And we now are conducting clinical trials because we need NMP approval for our complementary diagnostics for colon cancer. So this is where we are today. But someone asked me recently, we are now halfway through Inno Hong Kong. Inno Hong Kong is a five-year program. Time really flies. So where do you see magic in the next five years? Uh, I want to share in the last minute, this is where I see where we're going. I think we're going to have a big microbial biodiversity crisis. We're beginning to see increase in immune-mediated disease, asthma, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune disease. And the theory behind this, which there's a lot of truth, is that we are missing a lot of microbes that our ancestors gave us because of modernization, because of lifestyle, because of indulgence is unhealthy food, because we want to be happy and we don't exercise. And these missing microbes are what become our ancestors that we have wiped them out because of antibiotic use. The question is, how do we preserve that again? Now, the scientific world for the last five years has been hunting for the healthy microbiome to treat people with different conditions. And it hasn't been that successful yet. 
And a few years ago in New York Times, it was said that why don't we go to the rural areas whereby the microbiome is still unpolluted and we can salvage and then maybe transfer it to the modern people who are obese, who get disease to help them. But this has raised a lot of skepticism because of the ethical issues of taking someone else and transfer. If we can save cord blood from children so that we can harvest the stem cell to treat them when they get genetic disease one day, if we can cryopreserve sperm and egg when people are still young and of good quality, the question is why can't we cryopreserve our stool? And one day, when you are young and fit and well as a child, if you save this with the host of gut microbiome, what about in 10 years, 20 years time, when you develop autoimmune disease, you could do a transplant back to yourself, right? Now, there's a successful example in the agriculture world. In Norway, the Goblo Seed Board is one of the most successful examples. They stored millions of seeds and crops that safeguarded to prevent it from extinction. So which means that one day we will not run out of food supply, basically. So what I'm proposing is, we've heard this exciting from Mr. Phillips and you know, Mr. Sue about the development in the GBA area, that what we need is now a Chinese or Asian microbiome board. Okay? I'm not asking for too much space <laughs> for humanity in the Greater Bay Area, so that we need to collect, preserve, and enable. I think we can rejuvenate the microbiome of our next generation. So I hope I've convinced you that we can build this microbiome Noah's Ark, whereby it's happening in the Scandinavian. They have started in the Western Bowl, but we now need an Asian and a Chinese one. I think this sounds like mission impossible when you listen to me here today. But I can tell you in five to 10 years time, if I stand here again, I think this has already taken off, in fact. So uh, with that, uh, to end, I hope I've convinced you there's magic inside you, in your gut. I hope no one is running to the toilet right now. but. <laughs> With that, um, we are really grateful actually for ITC, for ITB, for the support and Hong Kong STP for giving us a home in Science Park at 17W. And this is uh, greetings from the um, Magic family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for the excellent talk. So let's I would like to our next, uh, introduce our next speaker, Professor Leo Poon, who is the Managing Director Destiny of the Center for Immunology and Infection, C2I, and also the Professor in the School of the Public Health, Hong Kong U, and also the Co-Director in the Hong Kong U Prester Research Pro. Um, in 2003, Professor Poon uh, is the first who discoded the first SARS coronavirus sequence and the recent COVID-19 pandemic, his work led to the several key discovery about the SARS COVID-2. His funding helped to develop the evidence-based control measure to the control uh, to control COVID-19 and also some foundation for the vaccine development. Professor Leo Poon, please. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And thanks for inviting me to share our story to you. And I'm Liu Poon from C2I. So maybe I just want to give a little bit of background of ourselves. Right, so basically we are a bunch of our biologists and clinicians who work on a very dangerous pathogen, virus. So you heard about H5N1, 97, SARS in 2003, and then H1N1 swine influenza in 2009 and so on and so forth. Now up to 2019, we have COVID, all right? So we have been characterizing these viruses, not only in humans, but also in animals, right? Our strategies try to understand how these viruses jump into human and can we try to use different models to try to characterize them and try to develop evidence-based control measures to prevent this spill of the event, or also try to control this disease within human population. And I would say that um, we have been quite successfully academically. So we are doing the research hub in Hong Kong in doing EID. And then uh, just in the last two and a half years after COVID, we published about 150 papers in Nature, Science, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Right? But not only that, I mean, we do have a good impact internationally in public health. Sorry, can I get back? Yeah. So um, 
we actually are advisors in various international health organizations like WHO, OIE, and FAO. So we routinely have meetings, try to advise the team, set up guidelines, set up recommendations, like for example, you heard about alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or whatever, of these kind of VOCs. We have been following them day in, day out. So we have a very close monitoring of these emergent infections and make our guidelines to various healthcare organizations. And of course, with this, we have many opportunities to try to develop new technologies. I just give you one example. Like in 2020, right, January 10, that was the time when the first SARS-CoV-2 sequence available in the public, just in two weeks time. We developed an assay, we passed it to WHO, and WHO posted it in their website. And in a few months time, we already share our reagents test for free, okay? to over 70 set countries all over the world, right? They can manage to use the assay to detect the patients, to try to make control measures to prevent the spreading of the disease at that particular of time. Of course, sadly, COVID uh, cannot be controlled and become a pandemic disease. But what I'm saying is we have been doing this with a global health impact. And of course, if that, um, I think we should do more. And so, a few years ago, we decided to actually set up a company with the support of the uh, Hong Kong government and Hong Kong Science Park. We set up a company called C2I. So our mandate is try to develop better tech strategies to control emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. And try to use novel technology for discovering biomarkers and also develop new vaccine platform and therapeutic strategies. And our string is we are a bunch of well-leading scientists and we are real public health practitioners. We know the need, how we can manage to promote, promote health. And we have a good infrastructures and we also have a bunch of a good well-established model to understand this type of disease. Right, with that, in two, two years ago, we set up a company, C2I, in Science Park, 70s uh, W, and the, our co-directors co -direct, are Professor Pierce and Professor Roberto Busuni. And under these programs, we have four programs, one, two, three, and four, all right? And then they're all aiming at one thing, try to develop better control strategies to prevent infections. So I'm going to go through this project very briefly. For program one, this is a health uh, human global project, Hong Kong. So. Now, let me ask you a question. So, you know, we have COVID vaccines. Why some of them have been vaccinated and they still develop disease? Why some of them develop a disease and they end up in ICU? So, because we are all different. We respond to the vaccines, we respond to the infection quite differently. So, the project of this is try to analyze 100 people in Hong Kong, sorry, 1,000 people in Hong Kong Right, to try to take the blood from and analyze the genetic sequence, phenotyping, basically, characterizing the immune response of their B cells and T cells, and also try to do analysis of their microbiota so that we can all use all bunch of data set to try to identify local markers so that maybe a few years later, um, we can take a blood and then I tell you, if you have been infected by COVID or influenza, you may be end up in ICU. So you should try to be prepared, all right? And you should be vaccinated, okay? And, and so we try to want to use this platform to inform people and make a personalized, personalized decisions about their risk, okay? And you may, you may think this is far-fetched. That is not the case. Basically, Pasteur, Fair Paris, have been actually start this program about 10 years ago. So we now will introduce this platform into Hong Kong and then to a G GBA as well, so that we can able to inform our community. Okay, so now once you know the risk, how can we prevent that? We know there's a vaccine. The vaccine is not, right now, it's not so great. So the program tool in this c company is trying to develop a better vaccine. Uh, I'm just using influenza as an example. There are two major hurdles. Number one, 
you heard about avian influenza virus, H5N1, H7N9, swine influenza virus, the pandemic uh, in 2009, right? These animal viruses keep on jumping into human and cause problems, right? So this is one issue. Right now, we don't have any influenza virus vaccines which are able to cope with these problems. Secondly, the other problem is the current seasonal influenza vaccine is far from ideal. In a good year, maybe you have a vaccine effectiveness about 80%. But in a bad year, the vaccine effectiveness will be down to 20 to 30% because it's a vaccine mismatch. So you may hear that once every few years because our vaccine is actually not so good, right? So the program in this C2I is trying to develop using our uh, patented technology to develop universal influenza vaccines, light influenza vaccines, so that to cope with these two or address these two problems. And now we are translating this platform to develop COVID-19 vaccine as well. Right now, I skip, skip program three first, but I would like to talk about program four. Okay, so now I have a, I can able to tell you whether you have a high risk to be infected by a pathogens, or maybe you had a high risk end up in ICU after the respiratory illness, right? And then I now provide you our vaccines, which can protect you. But what if, if you're so unfortunate that you end up in respiratory infection, end up in ICU? So who can, or which drugs can kill you, treat you better? So program four is try to, develop a platform, we call it ex vivo culture, try to take some lung tissue, respiratory tissues, and try to do drug screening, right? Like for example, small molecules, stem cell therapies, to try to find a better way to treat acute respiratory lung injury, right? Not only that, now we have the technology to try to take a swab of yourself, all right? And then differentiate it into we call it 3D organoids, just like a mini organ, mini lung, mini tissues, and so that we can test the drug. And imagine that, right? Maybe a few years later, we, someone get into a clinic, do a normal healthcare checkup. We take a blood from yourself, and we take a swab of yourself. And for the blood, we'll do email phenotyping, like the program one that I have mentioned. And then program four, we try to use the swab cell collected from swab to differentiate into this organ, and we will try to test some of the drugs that are responsible for or treating particular type of disease. So that we can have a comprehensive portfolio to try to identify the risk and tell you what type of treatment you should need when you have a disease. And then of course, we hope we have a vaccines that can prevent you from infections. And lastly, which is not related to respiratory infections, when we develop this program, we are, asking, we are asking ourselves, so in Hong Kong, apart from respiratory illness, what are the gaps that may be related to infectious disease? And then this is the things that we can think of, right? I don't know whether you remember this, in 2019, 18, we have a dengue outbreak in Hong Kong. And a couple of years ago, we have sick problem in South America. So with the global warming, warming issues, vector-borne disease will be a problem. And actually, it's now it be a problem in some countries now. And then you heard about chikungunya and something else. So program three is try to understand this. Uh, we call it better bond disease or better bond viruses. Um, we try to try to look at the ecology and to try to identify new viruses and identify, identify new antivirals and also try to come up with some better control measures to control the pest in Hong Kong, right? Okay, so this is a summary of all these four programs. Uh, I don't want to go through it again, uh, but each of them actually have their own PIs and try to work on them by themselves. And then of course we collaborate with each other a lot. Right, so this is uh, our strategy plans where we want to try to develop our own research programs and then try to generate spin-off company. And more importantly, we would like to collaborate with industrial partners to try to actually move things forward as I told you before, uh, most of us actually work in academic for many years. So uh, this is a completely different ball game in working in the industry. And we would love to be involved 
in this science. So I'm, I hope that in the next couple of years, we can manage to work with you guys and try to come up with something which is more useful, more impactful, so that we can promote health. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Poon. Last but not least, may I invite our uh, last speaker of this session, Professor Ben Thompson, who is the CEO and Scientific Director of the Center for Eye and Vision Research, CIVA. And he is also the professor and a, res a university research chair within the School of the Autometry and the Vision Science at the University of Waterloo. And Ben's research interests and compressed human uh, visual development and the neuroplasticity. His work had led to the new treatment for the recent loss, including a video game based treatment for the uh, lazy eye that has been now be developed by Novartis. So may I join hand to invite Ben? Thanks very much, Carrie, and it's been fantastic to have the opportunity to uh, introduce the Centre for Eye and Vision Research to you today. And it's also been wonderful hearing about all the amazing uh, science that's going on within the InnoHK initiative in all of the other centres. So the Centre for Eye and Vision Research is a collaboration between the University of Waterloo, where I'm based, and Hong Kong Polytechnic University. The core of the centre is formed around the two optometry schools in those universities, and we've brought in researchers from a range of other different disciplines to address key issues in eye and vision health. So let me start with the problem that we're trying to address. Vision loss is a major worldwide problem, and the World Health Organization estimates that 2.2 billion people experience some form of vision loss. The major causes of vision loss include uncorrected refractive error or blurry vision. This can often be corrected with spectacles, but in other cases, it needs other technologies to recover vision. Glaucoma is a neurodevelopmental disease, a neurodegenerative disease that causes a loss of side or peripheral vision, affects over 7 million people globally. Dry eye disease causes uncomfortable eyes. It doesn't sound so serious, but it can have a major effect on quality of life, and it gets significantly worse with an aging population, and it's becoming a major problem. Age-related macular degeneration also, as the name suggests, uh, becoming a bigger problem with an aging population. This causes a loss of central vision and forces people to rely on their side vision for day-to-day -day life, which is extremely problematic, as I'll describe shortly. And then finally, diabetes can also lead to serious vision loss. So in the Center for Eye and Vision Research, our mission and vision are aligned with the idea of creating new technologies to address this worldwide problem. We're looking at new treatments to recover vision and also technologies to maintain healthy vision in an aging population. So let me first of all introduce our five research platforms within the center, and then I'll give you some examples of some of these specific projects that we're working on across these platforms. So here you can see the, the major platforms. Our, our, our premier platform is myopia and eye growth, which, as I'll describe, is a particular regional problem. Then we have a range of other problems looking at vision rehabilitation, drug discovery and delivery, and development of advanced technologies. Now, within 17W at Science Park, we have a biomedical research facility, and we also have a human clinical trials facility. And in each of these research platforms, we have projects that focus either at the bench top, the drug discovery side, for example, projects that are translating those discoveries into human clinical research. And then, as is the focus of the InnoHK initiative, we're looking at translation and commercialization of those research findings. Let's begin with the myopia platform. This is a, a major problem, a growing problem. As you can see in the figure here in the bottom left-hand corner, the prevalence of myopia has risen dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years. And it's a particular problem in Asia. Myopia occurs when the eye grows too large and it becomes elongated. Now, myopia causes blurry vision, but high myopia or a large overgrowth of the eye dramatically increases the risk of vision loss later in life. In the myopia research platform, what we're trying to do is understand the mechanisms that control eye growth, develop technologies that can manipulate those mechanisms, and then take those technologies into the clinic in order to control myopia. 
And I'll give you an example of a very successful project that's being further developed in our center shortly. In our drug discovery platform, we have two main objectives. The first is to try to find more effective ways to deliver drugs to the eye. Any of you who've ever tried to use an eye drop will know that it's not the most effective and efficient way of delivering a drug into the eye. Most of it rolls out. You might blink it out. In the center, we have technologies looking at drug-infused contact lenses, for example, or ocular inserts for slow and controlled release of drugs to the eye over time. We're also developing technologies uh, to enable drugs to penetrate the front surface of the eye so that they can reach targets at the back of the eye where many diseases are, um, have their main effect. This is currently achieved through injections, but we're hoping that with new, these new technologies, we can combine the drug delivery methods with drugs that will avoid the need for injection, injections directly into the eye. Research program three is a vision enhancement program. This is where my research intersects directly with the center. We're looking at technologies that can preserve healthy vision, but also technologies that can open windows of neuroplasticity or the ability for the brain to change so that we can train patients to better use their residual vision. It's quite unusual for somebody to be completely blind. Most people have some vision left over, and we're trying to alter the way that the brain uses that remaining vision to optimize people's quality of life. In platform four, we're particularly interested in dry eye. We're interested in why dry eye has a greater prevalence in Asia than it does in North America. So we're analyzing tear samples, both at Waterloo and in our uh, NOHK center here in Hong Kong, to compare tear composition between those two continents. We're also interested in whether we can use tear samples to detect systemic diseases. So in the future, maybe we'll take a tear sample rather than a blood sample for certain types of medical testing. And finally, in our advanced technology program, we have a particular focus on ocular imaging, both for the early detection of eye disease, but also potentially for brain diseases as well. The retina at the back of the eye is actually part of the brain, and it's the only part of the brain we can actually see through the front surfaces of the eye. So we have projects that are looking at technologies to detect neurodegeneration, for example, in the retina that could be a biomarker for neurodegeneration in other areas of the brain. So just in the final few slides, let me give you an example of some of the projects we have ongoing within the center. We'll start with myopia. As I mentioned before, this is a major regional problem. If we look at the prevalence of myopia worldwide, we can see that in many places, such as Europe, North America, the prevalence is less than 50%. In Asia, it's greater than 80% prevalence of myopia. So it's a major issue. Now, one of the, uh, the major breakthroughs in this area has come from two PIs in our, in our center, uh, Professor Tiho, uh, Chiho To and Carly Lam from Polytechnic University. They've developed a really ingenious technology. It's a spectacle lens that you can see on the left-hand side of the slide here. It has a region here that corrects the refractive error, so it gives clear vision. And then it has these micro lenses around the outside that projects a myopic defocus on the retina. It tricks the eye into thinking that it's grown too long. And this slows down the rate of myopia progression by 60% in their clinical trials. An amazing technology, now available worldwide, with millions of children using these spectacle lenses. And in the center, uh, Professors Toe and Lam are developing the next generation of these myopia co uh, control devices. Also talk about one of our quantum optics projects, which is a collaboration between the Institute for Quantum Computing and our research center. But before I do, let me just say one or two more words about macular degeneration. So as I mentioned before, this is a disease that affects uh, over 8 million people worldwide. And here you can see a simulation from the National Eye Institute of what it actually means if somebody has macular degeneration. There's a loss of central vision that requires people to use their side vision for day-to-day -day viewing. See over here. So this um, causes a number of problems. We have lower resolution with our peripheral vision. We also have a phenomenon called crowding, where it's very difficult to tell adjacent objects apart. Now, crowding is related to how the retina is structured, but also to how the brain uses information from the retina. I'll give you an example. We'll see if it works on this screen. If you look at the dot in the middle, it should be very easy for you to see the E on this side with your side vision, but very difficult for you to make out the E on this side because it's crowded by these two adjacent letters. So in our side, our peripheral vision, it's difficult to tell these objects apart. So now let's move on to 
two technologies, one for detecting macular degeneration and one hopefully for alleviating crowding. With our quantum optics team, we've developed a structured light beam that has polarization that's wrapped helically around the edge of the beam. And we found in our, early, in our initial work just two years ago that if an observer looks at this beam, you can perceive a pattern that's projected onto the retina. So the polarization within the beam interacts with the nerve fibers at the back of the eye and projects a pattern onto the retina. So this was a, a discovery demonstrating the human eye can detect quantum states of light. What we're doing now in the center is looking at how we can use this technology for the early detection of macular degeneration. The pattern that you can see here is affected if there are very, very small changes in the structure of the retina. And we can mathematically model how those changes will affect the fringes of this pattern. And we're hoping that this will be a new technology for very early detection of small changes in the retina that predict um, macular degeneration and can enable early treatment, early detection and treatment. And now coming on to neuroplasticity. Within the center, we're very interested, as I mentioned before, in technologies can enhance neuroplasticity so that we can retrain the brain to optimize residual vision. And one of the techniques we use is called non-invasive brain stimulation. This is a suite of techniques where you can use either magnetic or electrical stimulation to temporarily alter the excitability of targeted brain regions. And we can also um, alter the neurotransmitter concentration in those regions. And this enables these windows of neuroplasticity. This is the, the lab-based version, clearly with me sitting underneath it. This is a programmable version that can be taken home in order to deliver this therapy. And we've had very promising results uh, with, it, with this particular technology in people who have amblyopia or lazy eye. We also have a major glaucoma study running at the moment. And these are initial results from our macular degeneration study. We, we asked people to detect the central target here that was crowded by these two peripheral targets. And we measured how bright this target had to be for them to detect it. And here we have the, the results of baseline. And whilst we were, whilst we were stimulating uh, the brain five minutes after and 30 minutes after, Patients had either the real treatment or in a different session, they had a placebo treatment uh, or a, a, a sham treatment. And long story short, we got a 30% improvement in their vision, in their side vision with a 20 minute intervention. So the next stage in this program is to see how we can make this effect longer lasting. Currently it lasts for 24 hours. Now we're looking at how we can program a treatment of, of, of a program of treatment in order to have a sustainable clinical effect. These are some of the, uh, the examples of projects that we have running in the center. Um, I'm extremely pleased to have had the chance to describe the center to you today. And if anyone has um, any, any questions or they want to get in touch to talk more about our research, please feel free to contact me directly. I'm more than happy to, uh, to talk with anyone about the research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ben Thompson. So next, we will have our Q&A session. And then so for this Q&A session, we will have uh, all this uh, health and inno uh, speaker. And also that I could also invite um, Professor Francis Chen. So um, he is uh, also the co-director of MAGIC to join the panel discussion. So if you have any questions, that's feel free later on and then to raise your hand and then to ask the questions to our, to our uh, director of the Energy Center. Okay, so may I invite Professor Dennis Lopez to come over the stage? Uh, Professor Xiao Ng, Professor Francis Chen, Professor Leo Poon, and Professor Ben Thompson, please.
Yes, yeah, so first, any uh, question from the audience? So grab the chance to raise the questions and then for, for the Inno HA Center directors. Uh, yeah, so Charles, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this very impressive uh, uh, story about what we are seeing in Hong Kong and what we're witnessing. I'd like to ask each, every one of you, if you could just give us your take about how do you see the Inno you know, Hong Kong and also Hong Kong as a hub in what your work is doing and how can we help you to, to, to make it to the next level? Um, thank you. Uh, um, excellent question. Thanks, thanks, Charles, for that. Um, I think one thing that we found uh, that's extremely beneficial in the centre at the moment is uh, the, the training programmes that the um, Science Park are putting on for our emerging researchers. They have a lean launcher programme that's been extremely successful. Um, and I think one problem that we face, well, that I, I face and maybe some members of my team, is that we, we really are scientists. And so that support for understanding the commercial landscape and how we interact with commerce in Hong Kong has already been very beneficial. And I think that's the main source of support that we would benefit from in the future. And then, Peace? Uh, I think that actually, if Hong Kong were to become a, a regional hub in technology innovation, there are a number of obstacles that need to be overcome. Now, for example, one thing is that if you want to be a hub of anything, there has to be free transfer of samples and data. But currently, we don't. You know, for example, I've been back in Hong Kong for 25 years. Apart from one tiny bit during the SARS, the first SARS, I have access to a Chinese sample, but after that, I don't. If I have that much difficulty, I'm sure that yeah, other people will have difficulties. And even under the current Greater Bay uh, framework, it's only actually a tertiary institution. There's no manager of bi biotech companies. So I think that really has to be solved. And number two is that there's certain high-tech area in mainland China, which actually as a Hong Kong citizen, we cannot open a company there. Now, for example, one of those is uh, genetic testing. So, so one question is how can we be a hub if I cannot open a company? You can only do that through a VIE, a variable interest entity. And of course, we all know that is a gray area. I mean, we can't build our future on some gray area. And the final area is on patent protection. Uh, because currently, if you have a patent which is granted in China, we, have, we can register in Hong Kong, but not vice versa. I mean, since 2019, December, Hong Kong started to examine our uh, patents. And under the 14 five-year plan, Hong Kong is supposed to develop in the IP hub. But once again, if our IP cannot actually be exercised, for example, in the Greater Bay Area, then I think there's some difficulty. So I think those three things really need, need to be solved. Thank you. Well, first of all, Sue and I do not believe inno centers are off-campus academic research centers. So I believe the first thing we have to do is we have to change the mindset of the researchers and importantly, the mindset of the senior administrators in the universities. Number two, despite all the exciting innovations that you have heard this morning, uh, Dennis just mentioned some of the obstacles. I believe what I want to say is to emphasize some of these obstacles are really um, very difficult to overcome without the support of the government on both sides. For example, with all our innovations, we need to repeat our clinical trials, everything in China in order to get the regulatory approval. Any chance that we can have this kind of special approval uh, given the very high standard of research we have done in Hong Kong? I myself talked to the Department of Health Regulatory Authority on different occasions. The simple answer is Hong Kong is just too small to have an FDA equivalent body to do all this kind of regulatory approval. But the thing is, is it really possible to have some kind of regulatory authority to inspect, to approve the innovations that we have done in Hong Kong for the Greater Bay Area? 
Um, so these are some of the important issues that if we really want to take it to the next level from InnoHK Research Hub to something that can really turn Hong Kong into a biotechnology hub to nurture talents to create job opportunities to generate huge in an economic kind of income return to the to the to Hong Kong. These are the important things that we have to do. Sue, do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you. I think I mean there's a say you want to go, you know, fast you go alone, you want to go far, you go together. And I think there's a lot of excitement going on, talking basically about the loop area, the Shenzhen Institute the buildings, the space there. Uh, I think it's the proof is in the pudding. It's the execution of when that will happen. So I think to overcome that, I mean, there are two ways. One is either you have exemption for some special, like certain regulatory or sample transfer or clinical trial, so you don't have to duplicate everything. The second thing is build our own in Hong Kong. So I think the question is like, we've been wanting to have a GMP facilities. Our microbiome can be turned into a drug, into a product, but we need a GMP facility in Hong Kong. But there isn't really one for such of that. So which means that every time we have a new you know, invention, we have to ship it all across to China, and then we have to bring it back again. And one of the key barriers also, what Dennis has said, is that we have to go through now the human genetics uh, approval, and that takes take years. So it's really not efficient. So I mean, I think there are these are the barriers. There's no right or wrong, but which one that if we can have some facilitation or endorsement to speed up, that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to echo Dennis said, um, so ch exchange of samples seems to be a huge issue. I mean, I mean, I work on infectious diseases for more than 20 years by now. And then um, it is very hard to have access to samples, I mean, in China, and, and which is a bad news to us as a public health practitioners, right? Because we want to learn a lot. And in Hong Kong, relatively, we are quite homogeneous. Basically, we have less chance to actually have infections, right? So, um, so basically, uh, we, there were a lot of interesting cases in China, but then we have no able to unable to assess them unless you get to China and do the work, right? And, and so this is something that I think all of us are very concerned about it. Um, and and now in Hong Kong, I think we need to increase uh, our capacity. I mean, in infrastructure, right? I and mean, then having a GMP lab, and then I have been uh, keep on asking someone keep on asking us whether we can test their materials in the BSL three settings. And of course, we are academic institutes. In the past, in the last 20 years, we're only doing research. There's no incense, incentive for us to actually do translational research. Academically, we are good, but then we, we don't really care, I mean, in the past, how applicable of these findings in commercial business, right? So now we, we need a platform. And then in the last 10 years, we have been given ask ourselves what can be done. I think having a BSL free labs, uh, in Hong Kong, and which can able to serve a lot of companies in Hong Kong, um, drug screening, vaccines, and therapies, and there are a lot of stuff can be done. Um, and but without this, that that means everyone have to go back to China or someone else, somewhere else to do the work, right? That that is another problem. Um, the other thing is how we can integrate to the GBA better. Right now, Hong Kong. I mean, personally, I'm still said hundred of percent of my time in China, in Hong Kong. So how can we actually collect better? We need some incentive for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. So there's uh, one uh, question from the online audience. So it's for Professor Siu. Mm? So they say that if one day uh, your work can, uh, if your work can commercialize to the stage that where we can actually has the instant check of what us do to find out that if we are healthy at home, uh, this is actually already happening. I think it's ha happening um, worldwide. I think there's a challenge in this. I think one of the key challenges, there are a lot of commercial entities that believe that they'll be able to check your stool and let you know how healthy you are. But the question is, how much of these are backed up by scientific discoveries? I think we need to learn to crawl before we can walk. So I think this is the space where there are a lot of skepticism about what we need to overcome that. I think at least in Hong Kong, if what we are doing can be sort of back up, not just by saying that we are doing it, by big data analysis, because in order to do it, you need billions and millions of data set to tell if someone is healthy 
or, or not. Otherwise, you're, you're lying. How do you know what the healthy microbiome is? So in Hong Kong, we actually have been providing um, some of these sort of um, service now to tell how someone is healthy. And also, there's going to be a niche for us because the gut microbiome in the Chinese, in the Asians, in people who live around this region is going to be different from the West. So we don't have to compete, I mean, with them for, for that. We can differentiate ourselves by having our own artificial intelligence based uh, data set, microbial data set that we can utilize um, one day. So, I mean, for me, my dream of a vision one day, I mean, in the Greater Bay area or in China, like I was speaking, Charles, we have a Noah's Ark like microbiome and we could offer testing for children when they were born with uh, microbiome analysis to be able to predict their risk of disease, then we can move towards prevention medicine one day. Thank you, Professor. Um, any question from? Uh, yeah. Thank you, professors, for sharing your very inspiring innovations. So I guess for Hong Kong to become a biotech innovation hub, we need much, many, many more entrepreneurs like you who have been successful in actually translating your research into you know, a products for the public, for patients. So I guess, how, how would you say we can inspire more young people to follow into your footsteps to believe that actually they can make it happen like the way that you have done? Thank you very much. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I guess, um, um, touching on my, my answer to the previous question, one thing that we can do is to combine awareness of commercialization and, and, and the potential for that into academic training of our, of our students. So for example, as people are going through the first stages of, of university or even at high school to show how science can connect with commerce, because often people will pursue a career in one or the other, and it's quite difficult to get intersections. And the further people go along, the harder those intersections can be. So perhaps uh, um, showing the potential for the connection between science and commercialization early is, is one potential solution. I think actually to build a critical mass is very important. So now you can imagine we have 28 inno centers. So let's say if each center 50 people, and then half of those are young people, then you basically have several hundreds of people you're training this way. And hopefully now with the loop area, if it is you know several times bigger, then we'll gradually uh, boost more in, in, in this way. Uh, I remember actually I went to a talk by Albert Wong um, maybe a couple of days ago. He's talking about currently Hong Kong technology areas. You might be have something like several thousand companies. So hopefully if it becomes tens of thousands, let's say about 30,000 biotech companies, and then that would be a different story. And, and also currently in my laboratory, um, even um, students, even in the first year PhD, they actually start to learn how to write patterns. Because I think that skill is important, you know, because intellectual property is the foundation of technology. Um, yeah, I think it takes time. And, and also another thing which I think we are really lacking is that because I founded a number of biotech companies, but one of the things which uh, is really bogging us down is the lack of people uh, who can run it, executive. Because I think there's a, 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 a scarcity of people who know a bit of science and who know the business in Hong Kong and who is willing to run a startup here. I mean, eventually for some of my previous company, I have to actually recruit from, let's say from, from, from the Silicon Valley, which is not entirely satisfactory. I think we need our own local talents. Yeah, thank you. I guess Hong Kong is strange in that Virtually all top students, they go to study medicine, go to two medical schools in Hong Kong. And I don't think we can change this kind of mindset in the near future. But instead of kind of uh, forcing these top students to study other disciplines, which is very difficult, I believe we should create more um, space, more room for these top, top medical students to understand that their education is not just, just about being healthcare professionals to meet the healthcare shortage in Hong Kong. We should create more kind of opportunities for them to be exposed to entrepreneurship, innovation and technology during the undergraduate and postgraduate training. And that will require cooperation from the various stakeholders, including the Medical Council of Hong Kong, the hospital authority, that they're not just pushing the medical school to generate more and more kind of workers, workforce for the community. 
What what um I think the two things that come to mind. What I find very ironical is that we really want to push for entrepreneurship, but in a university in an academic setting, sometimes entrepreneurship is like money making. It's like the evil. <laughs> so we somehow need to change this mindset. And I think this is probably the time to change it. It might be very difficult twenty years ago when Professor Lo first sort of started, but we're already in a very good sort of position. So how do we work? For example, the industry or you know Hong Kong Invest work with academic institutions, the top two medical schools, to inspire them to say, look, you know, this is something that we want to work together to let these people feel that. When you have patents, you should commercialize because a lot of IP actually sit within a university, and they just get old, like in an old ancient library that never get commercialized at all. There are a lot, and these are young talents with scientific discoveries that never see it to the limelight. Then along that line, I think the second thing is the incentive, because it's very hard. I mean, we heard yesterday in the twentieth birthday about the journey of entrepreneurship, that people don't want to take risk <laughs> because it's a very risky thing. You know, ten out ten startups, nine out ten actually does not work. So the question is, what is the fallback? How do we reward these people who are willing to take、uh, that risk? I don't know the answer, but I think if we have、um, something for that, we find it difficult for our PhD student to give up becoming a doctor. To be a CEO of a company, but we need more of these people to run companies for us. For me, I am not worried to read about it too much because、uh, the reality was、uh, is we just don't have this ecology in the past. So we don't have a startup. I mean, we don't have a science park, and and now we have the platforms.、Um, are there are a lot of the young kids which are smart and hardworking. So we just need to provide the platform, provide the training. And then to attract them to actually be trained and do to, to, to try to achieve their dreams. So、uh, I think we just have to be patient, and we will not、uh, change the the things overnight. But then it takes time, just maybe years, to try to change, transform the ecology in the past, basically period on academics, and now to become more translational、uh, research. Yeah. So Sabrina, please. Thank you very much.、Uh, because I come from the Hong Kong Association of Pharmaceutical Industry, representing in international company. So, other than the、uh, local developed projects, um,、uh, how can we um、uh, attract more、uh, global investment into Hong Kong? Just like the topic today,、uh, the journey of biotech innovation and investment in Hong Kong. So,、um, if our member company would like to pursue it. Our parent company to invest in Hong Kong on their startup and biotech. Any any pitch、uh, we can make、uh, with the advice from all of you? Any edge we can introduce to our parent company? Well, I would say that、um, now, for example, we have a local、uh, five university which are in the top one hundred. And this is important because geographically, we look at the whole of China.、Uh, many of the、uh, good universities are, let's say, in Beijing and Shanghai. But actually, in the southern part of China, actually, most of those good universities are in Hong Kong. So there's one bit. So, so we have、uh, upstream、uh, translational power. And the second, of course, just now is mentioned the Greater Bay Area with this population over 17 million. Then there's another pitch. But but on the other hand, if we want to really pitch that well. We have to say that 70 million to us is barrier-free, but as we mentioned just now, if your data and sample cannot come, and if we cannot go in to open companies, then that's not barrier-free. So we need to solve that. And then also, if the IP here cannot be exercised in the GBA, then no matter how good our legal system is, it still doesn't help this. So, so I think those issue, if if those three things and some of the others which people have mentioned. Are soft, then we do have a pitch, and and also as、uh, Francis has talked about, if if a clinical trial done here, which is automatically recognized by NMPA, then that's also another very powerful thing. Yeah, thank you. Back. 
Uh, thank you, Professor, for the presentation. It's very insightful. Uh, this is Fred from Gobi Partners. So we are a VC firm uh, primarily investing in Hong Kong. So uh, one question is, uh, we, because we see a lot of NFAS technology and also uh, amazing things that are happening in, the, in Hong Kong, but I'm wondering how, as a venture capitalist, how do we work can work together because uh, it's a research center. So do we need to wait for your spin-off of companies or uh, and on the other hand, we see a lot of interesting startup in Hong Kong. So can can we refer them to license your technology or not? Because of, obviously they cannot afford expensive uh, DNA sequencing machine, but they would love to work more with you guys. So uh, please give us some advice. Thank you. Actually, maybe uh, I mean, to respond to that now, I think the InnoHK scheme is very unusual in Hong Kong because for the first time, our KPI actually include commercialization. They actually want how many startup companies we've got. So, so I think this is a very good that you know, if you approach any of the Inno Center, I'm sure they'll be very happy. But however, <laughs> however, because the scheme is so new, there's still some teething problem. And one amazingly surprising teething problem is the fact that under current contracts, we're not allowed to grant exclusive license. And that actually the university have been trying to negotiate a discussion with the government, saying that it's not on. Because from my experience, if you cannot grant exclusive license, then that license is actually usually not valuable at all. Because, you know, imagine a small startup, uh, you don't have anything exclusive, any other companies could have come in. So I think that really is something which I think we need to lobby the government to understand, you know. In fact, it's really pain in the neck. We've been liaising and lobbying the government for two whole years. It uh, seems that we don't have any government officials <laughs> in the audience. And it's most unfortunate that they have this kind of fear that whether the public money invested in InnoHK will be perceived as benefiting a small minority of um, researchers, which is really not the case. So uh, this, um, as mentioned by Dennis, exclusive licensing, among many other issues, will be a major hurdle for um, the Inno centers to fly in terms of the commercialization and other uh, uh, potential entrepreneurship opportunities. I think Inno Center would definitely welcome partnerships as well with sort of you know, industrial. So there may be certain hybrid ways. I'm sure there are sort of um, issues, but uh, there may be ways of doing different types of um, partnerships in, in that instead of just you know, one of the um, investment um, avenue. So I think we'd love to talk to you. So basically, as I said, uh, <laughs> KPI as is one of the deliverable in the, you know, Hong Kong. So I mean, we, I mean, in the last two years, I've been talking a lot of investor uh, companies are almost every alternative week, right? Just basically just keep in touch. We just learn each other's and try to see where align, whether they have to actually come and go. And so that we can align all these objectives together. And to be honest, I mean, for us, we would like to promote help, right? So if someone can come up with good ideas, we can work together. I, I think that that is the objective of this. And of course, uh, apart from this, how we can translate our knowledge into something which is useful is also very important to us. Ben Thompson? So actually, I would echo that point. I think that partnerships are extremely, uh, extremely beneficial and we have to be quite creative about how we take our science um, and connect with commerce. And I'd also be very happy to talk to investors as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So that's the end of the Q&A session. So feel free to uh, just mingle with all the speaker uh, during the lunch. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, this is to the end of the section. So for people who join online, so uh, pretty much we finish and have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>